Um, I'll do a very, very brief um, introduction. I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and uh, thanks especially to uh, Dr. Julia Strauss um, for, for coming to speak with us today. Her topic is State Formation in China and Taiwan. Um, and this is uh, based on her very recent book, Brand State new. Formation uh, in China and Taiwan, Bureaucracy, Campaign, and Performance um, from Cambridge University Press. Uh, just came out uh, late last year, I think. Yeah, yeah, very and, late last year. Uh, Dr. Strauss is professor of Chinese politics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, also known as SOAS, University of London. She received a BA, Bachelor of Arts in Chinese Language and European History from Connecticut College, and both her MA and PhD from the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. She moved to the Department of Political and International Studies at SOAS in 19, uh, 1994. And she not served- 1904. Not 1904. <laughs> uh, and she served- I'm old, but I'm not that old. Served as editor of the uh, China Quarterly from 2002 to two th uh, 2011 and was promoted to professor in 2013. She offers courses in Chinese politics and comparative political so sociology. Um, and her, uh, her many, many publications include, of course, uh, State Formation in China and Taiwan, as well as from 1998 from Oxford University Press, Strong Institutions in Weak Polities, State Building in Republican China, 1927 and 1940. I want to first thank our a wonderful history club students uh, and Yay. Phi Alpha Theta uh, uh, honors uh, uh, chapter members, as well as the CSUSB History Department, um, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the College of Extended Learning and Global Education, uh, the Center for Global Management, College of Business and Public Administration, our friends here in the Fowl Library, Chukwe, and the ATI team uh, for, for being here. Uh, Peg Hill, Dr. Peg Hill in the World Affairs Council, as well as the University Diversity Committee, uh, and Pamela Crossan and Alan Yavor um, all around campus. We get lots of help and lots of support. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Strauss. Thank you. OK. All right, first, a, dis a disclaimer. I am extremely tired today because uh, we had, my husband and I had an unscheduled trip into LA and we're dealing and uh, it, basically his car engine is has to go into the shop. So I've come in from LA rather than the desert where we live and short sleep and I have this condition in my throat where I can cough very, very easily. So as I get into talking, um, I may very well start to cough and it's gonna sound terrible like I'm about to die, but I'm not about to die, we just have to kind of breathe and wait for it to pass. So if I start to kind of go and not be able to look like I'm really about to die, please don't worry. I'm not contagious. I don't have coronavirus. I don't have anything. It's just a very sensitive throat. OK, so let's talk about state formation of China and Taiwan, bureaucratic campaign and performative modalities of policy information, information implementation in the early 1950s. All right, so um, we have this, this thing um, that was kind of curious that happened in the middle of the 20th century, and it's something that maybe you've talked about a little bit in your history classes which it, on Chinese history, which is that the Chinese Civil War from 1945 to 1949, actually, it had been kind of ongoing with flare-ups uh, for the previous 20 years. In 1949, it produced a very unexpected outcome, late 1949, early 1950, which was the de facto establishment, the, esta the, the de facto uh, creation of two Chinese states that were vastly unequal in scale. The People's Republic of China, which was very, very large, which had taken over the borders, more or less, of the Qing Empire, minus some bits here and there, but more or less the very, very large territory of the Qing Empire. And the Republic of China 
uh, which had been the nationally recognized government of China between roughly 1928 and 1949, and then it continued to be uh, recognized by a number of uh, international states, chief among them the United States, all the way up into 1970. But it was now much shrunken in the actual territory that it controlled, and much shrunken down to a relatively small island, plus a couple of little outlying islands, um, close to uh, the very close to the coast of Fujian. Uh, and so we have this vastly unequal thing going on. And it's, uh, it was quite curious, because this was an outcome that absolutely no one anticipated. No one anticipated that uh, the armies that later became known as the People's Liberation Army would uh, march through and take over the rest of China so quickly. Everyone was stunned by the rapidity of the military collapse of the Guomindan. And uh, once this happened, nobody really expected that the Guomindang nationalist regime on Taiwan, i.e. the Republic of China, was going to last beyond the summer of 1950. Absolutely everyone expected that at some time in the summer of 1950, the uh, armies that weren't quite yet known as the People's Liberation Army, but were about this, at about this time they were becoming to be known as Liberation Army would launch an amphibious invasion of the island of Taiwan that they would de decisively defeat the Guomindang regime, now relegated to just this relatively small island once and for all, and this would be the conclusion of the Chinese Civil War. Now, it didn't quite happen that way because of the unexpected outbreak of the Korean War in June of 1950. And Prior to the outbreak of the Korean War in June of 1950, uh, the United States had pretty much publicly washed its hands of the Guomindang regime in Taiwan. And a couple of speeches were given in which the then uh, Secretary of uh, State um, had, in, a, in effect, uh, said, you know, Dean, the guy whose name was uh, Dean Acheson, you know, our containment policy beyond which we will not permit communism to spread is basically Japan and the Philippines. And Thai, the island of Taiwan and, South, and what became known as South Korea were not included within this defensive perimeter. And with the outbreak that was very sudden and very unexpected as far as the United States was concerned, with the outbreak of the war in Korea literally overnight South Korea, what we now know as South Korea, and the island of Taiwan were overnight included within the US defensive perimeter. And uh, to back this up, uh, the United States sent the Seventh Fleet to patrol the Strait of Taiwan to prevent the outbreak of any more hostilities on either, quote, on either side of uh, the Civil War. But de facto, what this meant was preventing the natural conclusion of the Chinese Civil War. So we have this oddity, this anomaly, this thing that just was not expected, real contingency, if you will, namely the, preserva the artificial preservation of the nationalist regime on Taiwan. Uh, so what do we have? We have two Chinese states vastly unequal in scale, the People's Republic of China, PRC, Republic of China on Taiwan, plus a few little islands here and there, uh, ROC. And both of these regimes in 1949-1950 were not regimes that you would have bet the, bet the ranch or anything else on. Why? Because the People's Republic of China was run by the Chinese Communist Party, which had taken over so, uh, central and southern uh, China, in effect, as an army of occupation. Now. We're used to thinking of uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party as uniquely having hit upon and come up with a successful set of methods of engaging rural re revolution and mobilizing the peasantry and getting the peasantry to see that their interests were the interests of the Chinese Communist Party and joining the army 
and fighting first against the Japanese uh, in the early to mid 1940s and then against the Guomindang in the mid to late 1940s. Well, the, the, and this isn't like, like all things that we believe as received wisdom, there is some truth to this. That you read this in Fan Shen, you read this in Ten Mile Village. And it's true, but it's only partially true. It's true for certain areas of North China in the 1940s. It is not at all true for Central and Southern China. And so you have an overstretched, thinly stretched Chinese Communist Party that needs to take over a huge, enormous, varied territory, which had not been under the firm control of any government, really, since the Qing dynasty itself. So there had been a full generation of only par any, go any central government having only partial control over this huge and varied territory that actually extended very far into Central Asia. So that was against, um, you know, so you kind of think, mm, major problem here for the Chinese Communist Party. Similarly, the Guomindang on Taiwan, for a completely different set of reasons, you wouldn't have bet the ranch on them either. Um, they were weak. They uh, were in disarray. They, ha they were traumatized. They just had the pants beaten off them in a searing experience of losing the Civil War and then retreating to an island where the locals hated them for reasons I'll get into in a moment, where they didn't speak the local dialect, um, where they were only holding, they only held the island by the sheerest of coercion. And this is never a good basis upon which uh, to consolidate a regime. And yet, despite these obvious weaknesses, by the mid-1950s, really within like three to four years, uh, both regimes were well consolidated. And indeed, I would argue that each of these regimes, one communist and left, I guess you're left, the other conservative and right, you're right, were almost exemplars of, a, of success for revolutionary and conservative authoritarian regimes. Now, we know that this became so. The, I mean, the, the, the literature is very clear on this. Both are successful and successful in their own way, certainly through the 1950s. But there's been very little in the literature on how this became so. We know that it became so. And we can point to different structures as to why. But we have very little understanding of the mechanisms and the techniques and the strategies by which this became so. Uh, and, and the ways in which there was movement over time between a situation in 1949 and early 1950 where the, when these two regimes had no interest in articulating their similarities. But in fact, if you look at things like structure and slogans and what they set out to do, there was a huge amount of overlap in what these two regimes uh, aspired to do. Uh, and yet by 1954, it's very clear that they are on different trajectories and that their tra different trajectories are accelerating to the left for the People's Republic of China and more to the right for the Republic of China. So my book that came out fairly recently is all about first stating, well, you know what, these two regimes have much more in common than, than is genuinely, is normally credited in the literature. They were not fundamentally different uh, in many, many respects at the outset of regime consolidation in 49-50. Um, but they became so over time. And my whole thing is how this became so over time. Moving right along. So I got to say a couple of words about why this focus on state building and PRC. The, uh, the region that I focus on is Sunan, the very wealthy area of it around Shanghai. So sh the city of Shanghai itself, its suburbs, its, its exurbs, and the counties south of the Yangtze River, 
in, in what is now the province of Jiangsu. This is historically the economic heartland of China. It has been the economic heartland of China since the medieval period when it was first settled. Um, it engages, it's been able to engage in double and triple rice cropping, heavily commercialized um, uh, agriculture for hundreds and hundreds of years, and so forth and so on. So uh, it's not the whole country by any means, uh, because it can't be uh, for reasons of scale. So you got to ask why this comparative focus on state building in the PRC, in Sunan, and the ROC, Taiwan. Well, the first uh, reason for this is that in the realm of post-World War II new states, there were relatively few opportunities to engage in this kind of comparison, holding culture and structure more or less constant, uh, but then looking at differences uh, and the acceleration of differences over time. Now, if we could get access uh, to North Korea, which we really can't, um, doing this kind of a project for North and South Korea could be very, very interesting. Uh, because in North and South Korea, you have scale, questions of scale also held more or less constant. Not exactly, but closer than Taiwan versus all of these which are still China. Uh, uh, if, if any of you are interested in Southeast Asia and interested in this kind of thing, I would recommend this kind of uh, project or a similar kind of project for Vietnam. Why? Because we have tons and tons and tons and tons of materials available in English, uh, which makes them much easier to go through, uh, that were collected by the US Army uh, when it went for South Vietnam. And as Vietnam itself becomes more open, my understanding is that at least some scholars are beginning to get access to materials, including archival materials there. So I would think that North and South Vietnam were, would also be very, very good candidates for this kind of project. There is, however, with China and Taiwan, a methodological problem of, of incommensurate size. It goes something like this. PRC large, Taiwan small. Uh, and the way in which I address this problem, it's not a perfect solution, but I think it's a, it's a roughly workable solution, is to shrink down the size of the People's Republic of China and to choose one region to focus on. And the region I focus on is Sunan. Uh, basically, it means south, southern Jiangsu, uh, the very wealthy and developed region around Shanghai, as a comparator for Taiwan for the following reasons. Both were relatively developed. Sunan is not a backward, impoverished area of China. In fact, it's, an it's a commercially vibrant, relatively wealthy area of China, where the lion's share of the industrialization and the modernization for China has been in the previous generation. Secondly, there's industry in both places. There's a very significant amount of infrastructure that has been put in place. Uh, in both places, and there in both places has been substantial movement out of subsistence agriculture. And then finally, the, uh, the, the main reason, well, th there are two other reasons for choosing Sunan. Uh, ready availability, at least when I was doing my collecting, things have changed now, uh, of sources, including archival sources of uh, the archives in Shanghai were very, very open uh, at the time that I was doing my collecting. Uh, and in both cases, these regimes come in as alien armies of occupation. They have very, very weak and shallow roots in local society, and they both understand from Jump Street that they need to sink roots fast. And so there are similar dynamics and similar problems of, uh, yes, we hold this territory by coercion, but we got to really do something else really fast. Uh, then, despite the enormous mutual hostility and the rhetorical claims of being absolutely different, we see that these regimes are, have very substantial overlaps in 1949 in structure and assumptions and st in state building agenda. So I'm going to take you very briefly through a chart that lays out, and I'm not going to discuss these in any detail. If you want the, the PowerPoint later, contact me in May and I'll share it with you. 
Um, <coughs> so here I've got a little chart of structural conditions and normative assumptions about state building more generally and the degree to which the, these features are shared by the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China and Taiwan, and the degree to which they're common in develop, would, it would be common to any developing state at roughly mid 20th century. All right, so we've got regional insecurity and heavy militarization. Yes, for both PRC and, and ROC, common in developing states, I would say yes. This is a pretty prominent feature of most. Outsider aspiration to either assert central control or reassert central control. Yes, yes, very, very common in developing, uh, developing countries really anywhere. Monocratic party state. Yes, for both the PRC and ROC. Variable in other developing countries. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Most of the time, no. High modernist commitments to science and development, absolutely in both cases here, sometimes yes and sometimes no in other developing states. The presumption of the amenability of citizens to didactic state instruction in whatever it is that the state cares about inculcating the citizenry with. Yes, absolutely in both cases. Pretty much no in, in more generally uh, in developing, uh, developing countries. The state to play an important role in ensuring subsistence and a modicum of social justice. Yes, for both PRC and ROC. Not really in most uh, other developing states. Deep uh, suspicion of all associational activity overseen by the state. Yes, shared by PRC and ROC. Not really. Uh, in fact, what you usually see in most other developing states is an effort to get associations, be they religious or community or whatever, on side, but not to directly try to penetrate. It's more like deals cut rather than you're going to register with us and then we'll send our people in to make sure. Um, and then the desire to impose order, vision, and communicate state norms rapidly to a subject population Yes, in both of these cases, and I would say variable um, in, in many other cases. All right, next. So, but here's my thing. States, I mean, these topologies are all well and good, but states aren't static. They implement policies. Uh, these policies are in turn part of state building. They attempt to implement preferences and choices in ways, and, and what I would say is in ways that are, uh, in ways that are distinctively, distinctively performative. They per are performed in ways that are distinctive to each regime, uh, that attempt to transmit regime norms, persuade populations, and at least attempt to build regime legitimacy. Uh, in the case of the People's Republic of China in Hunan and the Republic of China in Taiwan, what I do in going through a bunch of material is that I've identified what I call a shifting mix of campaign and bureaucratic modalities. Uh, bureaucratic and campaign modality are performed in really sharply contrasting registers. Public emotional mobilization for uh, the campaign and procedural rectitude, uh, obedience and austerity for the bureaucratic. But it's not just simply a case of the People's Republic of China doing one and the Republic of China Taiwan doing the other. In fact, both mix them up in uh, somewhat interesting ways. All right. Now, I'm sorry to bore you, but um, I'm playing around at present with ideas about bureaucratic and campaign modalities of policy uh, implementation more generally. Uh, this is a sort of general set of ideas that in principle could be applied in all kinds of different situations. Um, and in fact, you might, you might want to think about this in terms of American politics and just what you pick up reading in the newspaper because I think this, 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 these ideas might have some application to even contemporary American politics at present. All right, the bureaucratic modality of doing stuff, uh, policy implementation, is hierarchical. Uh, bureaucracy, by definition, mean is, is an organization like this. It's a pyramid. 
So the decisions that are decided on higher levels are incumbent and binding on lower levels. Because if you don't have that kind of hierarchy and that kind of o obedience and that kind of discipline, you don't have an organization at all, really. Okay, so bureaucratic is hierarchical, whereas campaign is a, ver a varying mix of hierarchy and egalitarian participation. Bureaucratic relies on regular, ongoing rulemaking, typically based on precedent. How do you know how you do something? Well, you refer to either a rule book or to the guy in the office who knows what the rule is. Um, whereas a campaign is, by definition, uh, in a sharp contrast to a bureaucratic modality of regular, ongoing rulemaking, because a campaign, by definition, requires extraordinary short-term mobilization of resources, sometimes the resources are material, sometimes they're human, to accomplish a particular goal or set of goals. A bureaucratic modality is depersonalized and delimited. Of, in, a bureaucratic, uh, in, a, in a bureaucratic modality of policy implementation, it doesn't matter who the person is doing the implementing, what matters is the official bureaucratic status and position of that person. So depersonalized and delimited, whereas a campaign by definition involves some degree of the mobilization of normative and emotional commitments that typically bleed into, that overlap with and bleed into other campaigns. And this might be the thing that I'm playing with the most and something maybe just to think about. A bureaucratic modality of policy implementation simplifies complex reality by disaggregating holes into standardized categories. So in a bureaucratic modality of policy implementation, you as an individual aren't really an individual. You are a, sta a bureaucratic status that then can be entered onto a spreadsheet. You're male, you're female. You're of a certain age or that certain age. Um, think about census questions. Um, it's a perfect example. You come from this large a household. You come from that kind of ethnicity. Um, you have this degree of schooling and so forth and so on. So a bureaucratic modality takes the whole, whether it's a person, whether it's a forest, um, whether it's an ocean, and disaggregates whatever the organic whole is into standardized categories that could then be um, combined with and measured against some other kind of benchmark. <clears throat> Campaigns also simplify complex realities, but they do so in a fundamentally different way. Campaigns simplify complex realities, not by disaggregating holes, but by fusing individual parts into holes, by compression and by a highly condensed morally charged narratives of good and bad, right and wrong, good and evil. So there are simplifications in both, but the basis of the simplifications is very, very different. And I would argue to some degree non-commensurate. OK, moving on to this. Now, we're going to move on to the fun kind of stuff. All right, so what am I, what am I going to talk about today after that lengthy um, I'm going to talk about regime insecurity and, and the ways in which the People's Republic of China in Sunan and the Republic of China in Taiwan launched campaigns of terror as a deliberate and explicit strategy of regime consolidation. Now, why I focus on insecurity and domestic campaigns of terror? Well, because domestic security in fact, it's one of the most important preconditions for regime consolidation. And this is something that both uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the Guomindang were very painfully, deeply aware of. Second, regime insecurity was plausible because all of this is ongoing at the time of the Korean War. The thing that you got to understand about Cold War is that in East Asia, it wasn't cold. It was never cold. It was very hot. There was a huge conflict with like 
machine guns going rat a tat tat and howitzers and, I mean, and, and armored vehicles um, tromping back and forth across the Korean Peninsula. And at one point, American divisions were very, very close to crossing the Yalu River, which was the border with China. So any regime would be very, very nervous about um, an arm, an army with vastly superior weaponry charging towards one's borders, especially when uh, the supreme commander of the army of that of that army was a noted right winger Doug, named Douglas MacArthur, prone to making comments about uh, bombing factories along the Yalu River and rolling back the tide of communism. So. I'm not saying that there's no reason to, to worry about regime insecurity. There is certainly plausible reason to worry about regime insecurity. And there certainly were some spies, subversives, and sympathizers working on both sides of the Taiwan Strait to undermine the regime from within. But on the whole, were these spies, subversives, and, and sympathizers really ever enough to seriously challenge the regime? Probably not. But the wider environment made it plausible to worry about such. For my purposes, what I'm doing today is focusing on how the PRC in Sunan and the ROC in Taiwan both deliberately resorted to campaigns of terror against presumptive domestic enemies of the state as an explicit technique to lower social resistance amongst the population and to not only get rid of baddies, but also uh, inculcate, begin to inculcate the population in regime norms and ways of doing things. So here we go. Uh, in the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries, this is just a contrast between the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries in Sunan and what we now call the white terror under martial law in the Orient. In the case of the PRC, um, we have um, a campaign called the Campaign to Suppress Counter Revolutionaries, the Zen Yapan Gumi Yizu, in 1950-51, and then it kind of calms down. Then there's another Sufan campaign to clean up counter revolutionaries four years later, uh, widened further with later campaigns against rightists in 1957, uh, another campaign against other rightists in 1960. Uh, sorry, another Sufan campaign in 1960, various other cleanup campaigns in the early 1960s, leading directly to the 10 years of the Cultural Revolution, which I won't bore you with, but, it's re it, but that 10 year period between 1966 and 1976 was characterized by uh, ever increasingly vicious cycles of deep concern and deep worry about uh, counter-revolutionary backsliding within the Chinese Communist Party itself. Contrast with the white terror under martial law in Taiwan, it starts going in, in a visible way in the autumn of 1949. It intensifies dramatically uh, in 1950 to 53. It rapidly drops off in 1954. And martial law continues until the beginnings of democratization in 1987. But um, there's much, there's almost no, uh, a political prisoners are occasionally taken and chucked in jail when they become too independent minded or too liberal, but there are no executions anymore. All right, let's think about scale. The scale of the terror measured by either percent, absolute numbers or percentage of the population is worse in Sunan than it is in Taiwan. So if you want to get into questions of where is it worse, if you're going by the numbers, it's worse in Sunan. Uh, I don't know why they ever let me see this file, but once upon a time I was permitted to see a file that included a, tr uh, 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 included a table of including numbers of counter-revolutionaries uh, sentenced and executed. So we know and this is too precise a number for it to not be real, or at least what they thought was real. 14,391 counter-revolutionaries were sentenced, or 0.24% of a population of approximately 6 million. 
1951, in the year of 1951. And 1951 has the peak of the campaign in the late spring and, the, and throughout the summer. And we know that in almost even 20% of those that were sentenced were executed. We also know that these were targets um, handed down from above, whereby local party, the local party committee was told that an execution rate of around 20% was, uh, would be the thing. So it, it's, it's too perfect a number, and we have other evidence from other places suggesting that Sunan authorities were given an, a rough approximation of 20% and of, of the sentence to be executed. Whereas in Taiwan, now this gets very squirrely, this, because these are numbers that I've had to kind of create from a variety of different sources that are internally inconsistent. But for now, just take it, take my word for it, that my own estimate of, which is conservative, it's certainly higher than this, but my own estimate is that there were uh, there was a minimum of 11,672, or 0.14% of a population of roughly 8 million on the island of Taiwan. Uh, so in terms of numbers, absolute, and in terms of percentage of the population, uh, it looks to have been significantly worse in Sunan. And what I also have to say is that uh, the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries was milder in Sunan than in almost any other region. Uh, it, was, it was serious, it was terrorizing, but it was much, much less bad than it was in most other regions. And we can talk about that with QMA if you like. However, when you look at execution rates in Taiwan, even though individual execution rates, uh, the, the aggregate execution rate, seem to have been somewhere around 10% or only half of what they were in uh, the greater Shanghai area, there was wide variability within what are called anjian or cases. So unlike Western jurisprudence where it's sort of one person and that's the case, cases made against one person or one corporation or one entity. In Chinese jurisprudence, a case or an anjian can be anything from one individual to upwards of 100, with the majority being somewhere around 20. And then what you get under pressure is the different cases become linked to each other in this sort of mega cases. And when you look at, start looking at, at cases, the execution rates vary from 0 to 57%. So there's a lot of work still to be done to determine why this variability and whether there were any rough rules of thumb um, or whether it was just um, sort of political orders to get more serious now and certain cases really got caught and others didn't. Now, in campaign as first kind of revolutionaries, this is where it gets very interesting. Only about half of the people who were sentenced as counter-revolutionaries had a political status that could be understood to be counter-revolutionary. And it was very, in a sense, bureaucratic. If you belong to the Guomindang military or security organization or youth corps, above a, thus and such a level, and it was stated, then you were by definition a counter-revolutionary. And you're pretty easy to find, because all you had to do was dig around in the archives long enough, and there were usually confirming paper trails. But the other half of the counter-revolutionaries, particularly when you started to get into market towns and villages and the peri-urban area around Shanghai, which was peri-urban at this point, was still pretty rural. Uh, the other half really weren't political counter-revolutionaries at all. Instead, they were what I would call potential social or economic blocks on uh, the power of the Chinese Communist Party. So they were called local bullies, or the leaders of counter-revolutionary sects, or they were petty criminals, smugglers, petty thieves, you know, street toughs hanging out on the, you know, hanging out on the street corner causing trouble. So a large number of the people who were rounded up 
would be the targets of any sort of law and order campaign as well. Uh, and so figuring out what regular crime was versus counter-revolutionary crime in a period of a heightened campaign was virtually impossible. All right, in Taiwan, far, far more many people were sentenced than there were members of the Communist Party in China. There are different figures on the numbers of uh, card-carrying Communist Party members in Taiwan. Uh, in print, the biggest estimate that I've seen is around 900. I have one oral history that suggests that the number was around 2,000. But th that number was an oral history, and it could have also included sympathizers uh, who were not card-carrying members of, China, of the Chinese Communist Party. Even at its maximum of 2,000, it's still less than 20% of the people who were sentenced. And the other accused was basically everyone. Uh, soldiers su suspected of having a suspect faction of loyalty. Um, leftists, socialists, sympathizers, independence-minded Taiwanese, and the vast majority were just those who were unlucky enough to be associated with someone who'd been arrested. Because when you were arrested, the way you demonstrated your cooperation was by naming names. And you could prolong your own execution if you kept naming names. So this set up a whole set of incentives to keep naming names. And there were huge, huge numbers of false accusations and people who did nothing more than be handed a leftist or semi-socialist or liberal periodical at a time when it was perfectly legal to read such things. And so there was ex post facto um, criminalization and worse. OK. So from that perspective, most people in Sunan and, Sh and Shanghai did not have reason to fear. Certainly members of the Chinese Communist Party um, and the Youth League had no reason to fear. Most people really didn't. But in Taiwan, I, I like to call um, the Guomindang in this period to be an equal opportunity repressor. They repressed everybody. They, they repressed themselves. They repressed elements within the army. They repressed the Taiwanese. They repressed mainlanders. They repressed everybody. And so no one, absolutely no one, was safe. Right, OK, so let's get into some of the differences. Preparing the public and official propaganda. I apologize for the graininess of this um, little clip here. Um, this came from a bad quality news, newsprint to begin with. Blowing it up has done no good, but I hope that it still is a, an illustrative example. This over here is quite widely circulated, widely circulated in Shanghai cartoon, a one of many, in preparation for the campaign. And it says, and what you have here is a sort of worker soldier shining a light on the evil, bad, counter-revolutionary special agent, you know, intelligence for the bad guys. So, and you can see that it's intelligence for the bad guys because he's hunched over, he's green, he's wearing sunglasses, he's wearing sort of Western clothes. You can see his transmitter with US on it um, down here. He's running away. Uh, and you have a little knife dripping red blood. So, and, the, and the caption reads, To Wu, special agent, Ni Wang Nani Paul, where are you running to? You can't, you can run, but you can't hide. OK. And so th this is one example of many. These cartoons are big. They're in color. They're splashy, they're humorous, they convey a message. Um, whereas in Taiwan, under the Kuomintang, this was the announcement of the capture of the top group in the Communist Party in Taiwan, the leader, the, the top, top leaders. And all it is is a very short newsprint article stating that um, the old cadres uh, the, uh, the, the old Chinese Communist Party cadres, this name, this name, this name, this name, age blah blah, from thus and such a, a county, have been arrested. 
and then the most that you got out of this, and I, this was such poor quality that I couldn't reproduce it, because the the, uh, the newsprint was blurred and very in a very small photograph to begin with. There was a, there was one slightly longer article with a with a, a photograph, very very unusual, of the leadership of the Communist Party in Taiwan, showing visually that they'd been captured. But other than this, there's there's almost no visuals and there's almost no narrative. It's a very short, terse statement where you're, the name, where they're from, their age, they've been captured, one small grainy photograph to indicate that this is true, that's it, we're done. So it's very, it conveys something very, very different. This is under control, shut up, no mobilization, no effort to engage the emotions, pure, Factual information, okay. and this gives you some idea of some of the differences. So, as these campaigns of terror are being performed, there's a real necessity to not only be different, to be, but to be seen to be different. And so, in Sunan, what you get is the Guomin, the Guomindang, the Chinese Communist Party trumpeting class struggle with openly, joyously affirmed campaigns viscerally casting out the evil baddies beyond the pale with rapid sharp strikes in public and it's very dramatic and it's very emotional whereas in Taiwan under the Guomindang what you get is the assertion of legality 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 rules 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 martial law martial law 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 in fact these laws are so dubious and they are so ex post facto and they're internally inconsistent um, that you know you could drive large trucks through some of the holes in these rules, but what they trumpet is legality, procedure, and denial of scale. Whereas the campaign bigs up its you know the numbers of participants. Well, they they call participating in a campaign showing up. That's participation. Um, rapid sharp strikes in public. Very important that they be in public and performed in public. Rapid, sharp strikes in secret with the, with the midnight knock on the door. You wake up. Your wife and kids have no idea what's going on. You're hauled out of bed, and you're hauled off to jail. And you might not be heard from again for years. And nobody knows what's going on. This is dramatic and emotional. This is all about procedure and rectitude and hierarchy and rules and order. OK. Now. Another cute little chart. The red for the communists and the blue for the Guomindang. Blue is the color of the Guomindang. So performing terror, participatory public campaign versus concealed legal quote unquote procedure. The form and type of performance in the People's Republic of China and Sunan is the Kung Su Hui, or sometimes it's also called the Dou Chong Hui, the struggle meeting, public accusation meeting. In Taiwan, you've got the martial law sentencing hearing. I'll give you some visuals in another minute. Uh, the how is the animating how of performance is the gao chao or the high tide, where you, where in the People's Republic of China and Sunan, you get the party gets together, a very large crowd. The the, the baddie is put on a stage above the crowd. Um, there is a an accuser, and the accuser is always either young, very young, very old, maimed, obviously disabled, or a woman chosen for masculine sympathy. And there needs to be face-to-face -face, face -face confrontation in public, in public spaces outside, where the accused must, uh, as part of his performance, publicly recognize and accept his guilt, chong zui. Uh, and the audience is required for the masses uh, to merge with each other as also, uh, and with the state. What the state wants is the execution of these baddies. And so the, the masses, the crowd, is mobilized as individuals to merge into one and to call for the things as a chorus that the state wants anyway. Taiwan, it's very, very different. The type of performance is the martial law sentence. 
hear it. How it performs is a reiteration of reapplied law. State decisions are being made by impersonally applied judicial rules of martial law. The players in the stage are the accused, the judge, and the military guards inside the confines of the prison. And the audience, now this is where it gets really tricky, as uh, near as I can tell, seems to be the state itself. The, the public and relatives are only the audience indirectly at several removes, because they only hear about it later in very muted form, if then. OK, a picture is worth a 1,000 words. This is a picture, it's not a very good one, of a mass accusation meeting. We don't know exactly where it is. We know that it's not Shanghai because it was uh, published, published in a major Shanghai, in major Shanghai newspapers about two weeks before the sharp strikes against counter-revolutionaries in Shanghai itself, which were at the very end of April 1951. Uh, so we know that it's not in Shanghai. It's probably from somewhere in North Jiangsu. And again, it's you know, been blown up a little bit too much, for which I apologize. But I think it's a fairly representative example because the images from this public accusation uh, session were publicized so widely in the run-up to the sharp strikes in Shanghai itself. And so what do you see here? The first thing that you see is that it's outside. The second thing that you see is that there is an enormous sea of faces sitting on the ground outside. In fact, there's no way to get a camera angle from the stage behind the accuser who's right here to, to take in the enormity of the audience. The audience is a couple of, is, is I don't know how many of people sitting on the ground. Over here, you've got this bald guy, is the evil accused. You can't really see it, but these are two soldiers holding him with, and there is a little rope around his neck. So when the charges are read out, and uh, the cadre says, drop to your knees, if he doesn't drop to his knees, uh, they'll pull the rope, and he'll drop down to his knees, because he'll be choked. Uh, the accuser is female. It's a little hard to tell, but she has hair down to here. I have a couple of other visuals that aren't as good from the same accusation meeting from the vantage point of the crowd. And it's very clear that she's in dramatic motion, like with big gestures. Uh, and she has to have a microphone. The crowd is so big that she needs a microphone. All right. Contrast this. There aren't a lot of visuals of sentencing hearings, but contrast this with the one that I have found that is in the public domain. This is the sentencing hearing of the case of a guy uh, and his associates by the name, the guy's name was Wu Shi. He's over here. And the first thing that you notice is that it's inside in a relatively small enclosed space. In fact, this looks like it, this is a dark velvet curtain. It looks like it's uh, a larger room that's been subdivided. You see that the, it is, the judge with a desk up here that is raised up, and the defendants are down. The accused are down. Whereas here, it's, it's exactly the opposite. The accused is up on the stage, uh, and, the folk, and, and the focal point is up, whereas the focal point is up to the judge uh, in Taiwan. You see Wu Shi, and there's no audience whatsoever. In fact, military police and officials far, far outnumber the defendants. I think that there are three or four defendants in this particular case. And Wu Shi himself, whose head has been shaved from jail, has le is leaning over some thick book where I believe with, with, a, with a brush. Uh, and it looks like what he is doing, what this guy is doing, is making sure that Wu Shi affixes his acknowledgment to each one of the charges in this thick uh, thick bound um, book, because he's definitely holding the brush, but he's definitely leaned over. So it's a very, very different thing. And it says something, these two visuals really do say something about each of these regimes. So why this insistence on such different performances? Well, the how needed to be demonstrated publicly, performed, to demonstrate new regime norms, to lay down public claims to regime legitimacy, to begin a process of educating the population into regime expectations and norms, and to show how different to us as, an, as analysts 
these two regimes were from each other, in that the goal of the Communist Party in the People's Republic of China in Sunan is to forge new social bonds and identification with the party as a progressive positive force via popular mobilization versus the ROC Taiwan goal is to get people to shut up, to post the rules, then to get people to shut up and to obey the rules with a combination of education into what the rules are and then to break apart old social bonds and to atomize individuals and their families and to separate them from each other and in this way get individual families and individuals to comply with the newly posted rules. So it's very, again, it's, it's almost a reverse image in terms of what each of these regimes is doing. All right, uh, the results of these different performances, quickly, uh, in the PRC Sunan, it's basically the same. They dispatch to find enemies of the state, and then some they cow friends and family. Uh, they, in the PRC in Sunan, they remove the impure from society, and then they publicly display them before executing them. In the ROC Taiwan, they remove the putative impure, and they hide them behind prison walls. They sequester them. In the PRC Sunan, you have pub a public and dramatic breakpoint in the revolution. It's a symbolic moment of no return. In the ROC, you have a demonstration of legality, quote unquote, that is directly tied to its legitimacy as the legitimate, publicly, openly rec recognized government of China between 28 and 49. So there's claimed continuity as well as legality. There's a sharp and public break point in uh, PRC. Um, in PRC and Sunan, you have the instruction of public to the new state determined categories, popular participation, as well as popular complicity in the state's violence against defined enemies. In the ROC Taiwan, you have warnings to public to comply with state law as individuals with the atomization of individuals and individual families from each other. In both cases, I would argue that these early campaigns of violence uh, establish templates for the country, for these occupied territories. PRC is repeating successful repertoires and lessons learned by the Chinese Communist Party in North China. Popular mobilization, merging, uh, public merging behind state chosen targets and scapegoats. And deep, deep attachment to this repertoire ultimately proved to be very damaging to the People's Republic of China because the party just can't give up this idea of popular mobilization and the accusation of targets. Well, once you get rid of the usual suspects, where are you going to go? You can really only turn this inward against newly defined impure. And the burden of proof uh, goes down and down and down and down and down. So with later campaigns, you get vaguer targets. With these techniques of popular mobilization, now applied within the confines of the work unit rather than in open public space, when everyone understands that this is a show. Uh, and the majority of people within work units know that they can't really get anything good, that nothing good is going to happen if they're too vigorous uh, in doing this. And this ends up being very formulaic for the majority uh, after a very, very short period of time. Um, I suspect that in 1951, the masses in Sunan really didn't understand that they were a chorus, that their role was that of a chorus in a state-determined show that was being heavily, heavily stage-managed by the state. By 1955, when the next campaign against counter-revolutionaries came along and everybody was nationalized and locked up into work units of one sort or another in urban areas, people understood very well what this was about. Uh, and this was all about power and the demonstration of the Chinese Communist Party. And there was nothing to be gained uh, by getting out there and making too many accusations. All right. In Taiwan, the opposite lessons were learned. In the early 1950s was a period in which the kinds of compromises and factionalism and co-optation 
that were felt to have led to such failure in China itself between 1928 and 1949 uh, were thrown out the window. There was a remarkable mobilization and coalescence of political will amongst the top leadership. Uh, and they understood that the that Taiwanese hated them. They just put down a major uprising only a few years before. So this concentration of political will enabled the regime to launch pretty effective, but also highly delimited campaigns. Uh, there was another major set of campaigns uh, to push through land reform, for example, as well as other things that I think could reasonably be called campaigns. But these were delimited campaigns. And these more minimal legitimated performances of legality and process ultimately required much less from the population in terms of demonstrations of loyalty. In the People's Republic of China, you needed to demonstrate more and more and more and more and more over time. In Taiwan, once the population learned the new rules of the game, basically to shut up and obey, um, uh, and to be very, very quiet about anything political or social that the regime uh, wanted uh, to be kept quiet and to not be articulated. Ultimately, much less is required of the population in Taiwan. And the population in Taiwan is given much more range to uh, get ahead as families, because the regime invests very heavily into education, pretty good education for the most part, uh, and as well as um, engaging in economic activity to get ahead materially. OK. Um, so a few final words on bureaucracy and campaigns. Even when I think they're not explicitly recognized as such, bureaucratic and campaign modalities are features of pretty much all state systems. And I think that the nexus between bureauc bureaucracy, bureaucratic and campaign modalities probably varies a great deal. They are in tension with each other, but at other times they can converge and be mutually supportive. So for example, campaigns need a certain amount of bureaucracy. They need the infrastructure and the coherence that only bureaucracy can provide. Uh, and in fact, under conditions of state building, they may lead to state expansion. And in fact, in the People's Republic of China, in this very early period, they do lead to state expansion. And in Taiwan, it does lead to state expansion uh, in, in terms of setting up, you know, sinking roots deep into local society, developing networks of snitches and informers, and so forth, and so on. Citizens keeping tabs on each other, and so forth. But if taken to their logical conclusion, campaigns undercut bureaucracy. And we see this in all kinds of places. Um, I'm not going to talk about the United States at the moment, because there are many, many examples that we could point to just in the last couple of months uh, in terms of our own system. Instead, I'm going to briefly refer to Turkey's campaign, uh, authoritarian, conservative authoritarian, increasing Islam, increasingly Islamic state, where the bureaucracy uh, and academia and the courts have long been bastions of secularism and secularism and evidence-based decision making and rules. Judiciary, um, judiciaries, that's what they do. And so we have Turkey's campaign to rid the country of so called Gülenists, those who might be in some kind of opposition to whatever campaigns uh, the, uh, the administration of Erdogan wants to push through. And so there, Turkey has launched a campaign, it is absolutely a campaign, to rid the country of. Uh, Gulenist secularists in civil service, in the judiciary, and in uh, universities, and in, I believe in, in secondary education as well. So, but if taken too far, you know, it's undercut. All right. So, if we think a little bit more about performance, the young PRC celebrated a particular constellation of participatory campaign and public performances with a very clear script and with a very clear program. But performance, I think, features, like campaign and bureaucracy, performance also features very prominently in other political environments, both authoritarian and democratic. And who the protagonists are, the institutions that undergird the performances, the expectations that performances send out, 
I think that is embedded in ways, very different ways that can either support or undercut the state. So in Taiwan, these performances were sequestered behind opaque walls and counter performances were simply blocked. While in the US and the UK, my adopted country, as recently as last October, um, you see bureaucracy and legality being performed. We had the, uh, the, t the, the top jurist in the United Kingdom coming out and publicly performing legality, saying to Boris Johnson's government, no, you may not simply uh, sequester, prorogue, or dismiss parliament uh, while in order to get through whatever it is that you want to get through in terms of legislation without proper oversight. No, call them back. And she reads out this absolutely devastating indictment, but it's all justified in terms of legality, rules, um, bureaucracy, if you will. And in our own country, Fiona Hill did very much the same for evidence-based speaking truth to power in, congressional, in the congressional hearing that last October. So here we have Lady Hall, this little old lady who's in her, well into her 70s, reading out this judgment that is devastating and signaling something with the spider, big spider brooch. Um, one doesn't wear a big spider brooch by mistake in uh, such circumstances. And here we have Fiona Hill taking the oath, again, public performance of a bureaucratic modality of decision making, uh, both wearing black, the understated jewelry. You know, uh, we think of campaigns being performative, and they are, but there are occasions under which uh, bureaucracy and legality may be performed as well. And I am going to leave it there. And uh, that was about a little more than an hour. All right, so let's take, what I say is we're a small group. Let's take some questions. Yes. Even though both, both, both groups are so different, the PRC was far left and the uh, Republic of China was far right. Um, they were similar in their acts of violence. Um, they were. Yeah. Um, they were similar in their acts of violence, but they were very dissimilar in the way in which the acts of violence were implemented. I have a question. Were they both similar in attacking groups such as religious minorities or ethnic minorities? Um, for example, if I think about with the PRC, you know, PRC is something I do know that they've been, but with the, with the Republic of China, like um, the No, no, they, no, the Republic of China was not, not exactly. In this period, the People's Republic of China is actually very, very careful about minorities. It seeks to bring them in and to not antagonize them. And so really until the, Un until really around the time of the Great Leap Forward in 1958, the People's Republic of China is treading very lightly in minority areas, much less so for religious groups. Religious groups are forced to register with the state or they're stamped out. And one of the targets of uh, the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries were non-official groups that call themselves religious, you know, heterodox sects rather than proper religion. They're, be, they're given different titles and they're treated very, very differently. So uh, religion as organized religion. <coughs> 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 associational activity, and it's forced to be organized and to register with the state and then to be taken. <coughs> um, come under state control with uh, people who will work with the state. So there's a huge schism and a huge set of problems with the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church only recognizes the Pope. And so, 
what happens is that there's that, that that Catholics who stay with the Pope are driven underground, and the Chinese Communist Party organizes the Catholic the Catholics, uh, the Catholic bishops who will work with the regime into the official church. In Taiwan, you have, um, as near as I can tell, um, a, a similar sort of look-in, whereby the big temples register with the state. But my understanding is that they're more or less uh, left alone, uh, because they, th because the really big religious organizations are Buddhist, uh, and the big or or Taoist, and those temples uh, historically have worked with the state. They worked with the Japanese colonial regime before. Uh, now, in the long run, this comes back to bite the regime. <laughs> Because when you get to the 70s, because the churches were never really repressed, they were sort of looked at, but never fully repressed and never fully taken over, what you see in the early 70s and the very, very earliest straws in the wind for democratization in the late 70s and the 80s is that the, the first mobilizers, the first safe places for anti-government opposition usually under the rubric of environmental movements. You have the Presbyterian Church becoming active in things like environmental movements, which are not within the state. And uh, the first real opposition to the state wasn't political, political, we want to overthrow the regime. No, it was local uh, environmental problems that provided a focal point for mobilization, and the Presbyterian Church actually provided a certain degree of protection for these kinds of groups, kind of 20 to 25 years later. So it, it's, it's quite different pattern. It's a great question. Yeah, it's just a comment, and I'm not a historian, so That's okay. it was, you know, and I was mentioning earlier too, like last year I was in China with a with a, like a plain slate, you know, I just yeah. wanted to feel and have a direct observation right. and whatnot. And the university where I was saying, it said, uh, you know, tell uh, the world about the great stories of China. Right. So it was all about us, you know, like right. them telling to the rest of the world. So my question here was, you know, I took a picture of your thing too, the structural conditions and normative assumptions mm -hmm. where you have compared uh, PRC and ROC. I'm not going to the history part and with the wo in the developing world. So I was just wondering, uh, is this a kind of, a, you know, how did you come to the table, like comparing with the rest of the developing uh, world? Or is it like a like historic or current or? Uh well, it's, it, it's historic. In okay. That, in that my time period basically is mid 20th century. Mid -20th, okay. Um, and so, you know, I have a, a, a sort of a certain passing awareness of what's happening with decolonization okay. elsewhere right. in the world. Okay. And most places that are decolonizing, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the most important one, of course, is most important one, of course, is India. Yeah. But there's a bunch of other places other that states. decolonize um, with much less, much more abruptly, and with much less infrastructure, yeah. and with much less in the way of organized political parties mm -hmm. than India yeah. um, in the 50s and the 60s. And so there's much less uh, sort of infrastructural capacity mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. many of the places that decolonize in the 50s and the 60s, in I'm thinking of Africa, I'm thinking of Indonesia, sure. I'm thinking of um, other countries in South Asia. Um, so rather than, rather than Latin America, okay. per se, where the, de the decolonization sure. happens much, much earlier. Sure. But I would, and, and there's much more in the way of social mobilization mm -hmm. uh, and political parties in most, in most certainly South American countries. But you also have sort of curiously attenuated um, lack of infrastructural capacity mm -hmm. in many, I would say most, uh, countries in the developing world. Mm -hmm. So the starting point is different. Okay, okay. Uh, if that makes really, sense. Yes, it, it was, I was just brainstorming and it was really good to even, I was trying to fit in, even if does it fit it now or not. To some extent, yes. To some extent, yes. Yes, yeah. So less so now, but yeah. to some extent, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah thank you yeah i was not in that phase but yeah. you know mixing and matching thank you so much yeah. thank you first i want to say thank you so much um my background is i born in the shanghai live there is 42 years and the immigration here but first time i hear that's the professor tell the truth about the china the history thank you very much oh yeah thanks. and uh, i was very interested for this the speech i take note and uh, some words i even can understand but i translate i went well is study study again because i didn't think in the in the, in the china in uh, early uh, 50s that's have the happened that the many the the activity and the have the the for the how to say country to how to make a development and the, on how to the government control the power mm. but it is give me very deep deep thinking to this the politics thank you and uh, mm, i want to say i uh, was in the picture you say the the veteran and the riding the brush mm -hmm. that is the chinese tradition brush the old tradition we use the brush mm -hmm. signed yeah so that is the the guy signed yep. is every the paper not, uh, yep. is organized that is I have this the yeah. the victim, so I signed, signed, signed. Is different is in the Taiwan and the China. China, if you have that one, just the people say you whatever you did, and you can't sign. It. You no. just care. You can't speak. You no no power give you the give, give you freedom. Okay, you only on the uh, oh yes, I did, I did. Mm. Only do that. No, and the, in the Taiwan, maybe they give you the some the sort of the freedom. You need to sign the something like that. No, yeah. yeah, there wasn't a lot. There, there in the end, there wasn't a lot of freedom. Okay. And what I and one of the things that I couldn't go into mm -hmm. in in the talk was that these performances, these uh, public accusation or sessions, looked like they were spontaneous, but they weren't. They were heavily, heavily prepared for ahead of time. So the uh, accusers were identified. First of all, all of the paperwork had already been done mm, for the yes. accused. So probably behind the scenes, there was uh, acknowledgment of, oh, I did this, I okay. did this, I did this. Because mm -hmm. each of these cases would have had huge amounts of paperwork. Mm -hmm. So that's point number one. Mm -hmm. they, these targets were not randomly chosen. They were already arrested. They already had the cases proven against them. Mm. They could have just been quietly executed in private. But no, they needed, or some subset of them, needed to be put on stage for public consumption, so to speak. Mm. Uh, so that is very, very different. But uh, the state had all of the power just to get rid of these people mm -hmm. in, in a prison, the way they did in Taiwan, but they chose to do something else with some subset, the, some of the worst offenders that could really rile up the public. But what, what was not clear was that the accusers were identified ahead of time. They were coached ahead of time. I have uh, uh, one example in, my, in the stuff, in my uh, materials, where the accused and the, the accusers, the accused, and some representative members of the public were brought in for a full dress rehearsal the, you know, a couple of days before the actual event in front of the thousands, where the members of the public were like, why do we need to do this? Why, why are we doing this again? And what the accused thought can only be imagined. Um, but we, know, we do know that in this one case, the local cadres were very, very indignant that the accused, the target, had, quote, and this is a virtually direct quote, had died without recognizing his crime. There's a, and so there is this, and I have other documentation that where um, local cadres are given basically guidelines.
a public accusation needs to do this, and it needs to do this, and it needs to do this, and it needs to do that. And if the accusation isn't spontaneous and full of color, it doesn't count. And if you don't have face-to-face -face confrontation, it doesn't count. And if, um, and if the, the target, if the accused does not publicly recognize his crimes, it's not a, it's not a good yes. accusation session. And then local cadres are judged um, whether they had a successful one or not. Uh, and it gets tricky here because uh, local officials write their own reports to indicate what did and didn't happen. And most of the reports are very formulaic. Yes, the masses were aroused, and yes, justice was done, and so forth and so on. But occasionally in these reports, you'll get hints of other things not quite working. The masses really weren't stirred up quite well enough, and they didn't really understand why they were there. Or m local cadres could be accused if um, the, the uh, proceedings veered out of control. And here's what was very interesting. Veering out of control was not the crowd getting so riled up that they stormed the stage and beat the accused to death. That was OK. Veering out of control was if the crowd really believed that this was a spontaneous accusation session. And they started calling out accusations against other people mm. who had not been vetted, mm. whose guilt had not been conclusively determined already. That was veering out of control. So a local cadre could be accused of not have of having sort of a sham or a fake accusation session that was formulaic. They could also be accused of, of the opposite crime of letting it go out of control, where the masses really thought this was a spontaneous, open, public accusation session where they could bring their own claims. So. I have other question. Is the <coughs> this the activity is the root for the Ch uh, China have the revolution or cultural revolution? <coughs> you oh, can you, see. you can see mm. that many of these techniques. are on display very publicly in the Cultural Revolution. But there's a lot that's happened between the early 1950s and the Cultural Revolution to mm. make the Cultural Revolution much worse. Yes. You're right. You're right. Yes, that's Any I other questions? Say. OK, thank you. <laughs> questions? I, get, I have a sense that people need to rush off to their next classes and so forth. We have about 10, 10, 15 minutes. Any other questions? Yes. Hi. So um, I was wondering if both in, in Taiwan and in the PRC, was there also heavy government control of the economy and dictating where the economy would go? That is a very, very good question, because we are used to thinking of Taiwan as being the place that got it right with high speed development and the development of a middle class and eventually, you know, that Taiwan sort of um, conforms in almost a textbook way to everything that Americans, people who grow up in American political culture, are conditioned to believe is true elsewhere in the world. So you have, you may have authoritarianism, but you have rapid economic development that's shared more or less equitably. Then you have the gradual rise of a middle class. Then you have that middle class gradually agitating for, asking for more of a say, and agitating for more democracy. And then you have the regime gradually, incrementally stepping back and permitting democratization. This is what happened, more or less, with a few civil wars here and there. In England, this is the great myth of, of, of um, 
Anglo-American political culture. We're moderate, we negotiate. You just have to have a middle class and development and then this will inevitably lead to demands for political change. And in Taiwan, they even did it the way that we like to see. There was no bloodshed, it was gradual. You know, everybody kind of figured it out. Okay, now, whereas the People's Republic of China, authoritarian, mobilizational, tore itself apart, everything stagnated, socialism didn't work, um, in the sense of uh, a, a planned economy didn't work, and, and you know, that it was, is everything that we're also primed to uh, believe is true. Well, reality is significantly more complicated. And in the People's Republic of China, in exactly this period, you have the government coming in and doing its best. In its first year of power, it just wants to quiet everything down, get people back to work, get production going again, and uh, replace um, the hyperinflation. Uh, because the economy was ruined by hyperinflation. But then you also see gradually in this period the government increasingly taking over factories. Some were already state-owned factories, but gradually regulating markets and then choking off markets entirely and replacing markets with state, uh, state stores uh, and state transport and distribution of goods, uh, as well as an increasingly stringent um, grain supply system uh, procurement that then is the foundation of being able to completely get rid of markets because you heavily subsidize your urban areas and crash industrialization with excess grain at well, well below market prices. So there's no tax quote unquote, in the People's Republic of China, but there is a heavy, heavy grain requisition, um, which can be you know, upwards of 50% that goes to feed the cities and crash industrialization. So we see in this period that I'm looking at, a gradual, first the regime works with markets, then it regulates markets, then it destroys markets and replaces markets with state institutions. Um, in combination with the grain procurement system, which was brought in quite abruptly in 1953. I can go on about that, but that, that gets too boring. I've done some other work on that. In Taiwan, you see kind of the opposite. There is, a, in industry in Taiwan is 50% state owned in the early 1950s but it doesn't work very well. <laughs> it just doesn't work very well. And so in the early 1960s, there's a set of American trained technocrats in the natural, re in, in a bunch of, uh, of uh, economic development commissions that basically get the ear of the top political leadership. And the top political leadership isn't so much Chiang Kai-shek, although he is the leader. The real chief Ohancho is Chiang Kai-shek's son, Zhang Jinghua. He's the, he's the real hands-on guy who's on, who leads all of the real committees that do all the real work and make all the real decisions. And in, it's in the early 60s that they make a set of very explicit decisions to lower the share of uh, state it, of state-owned industry to lower tariffs uh, and to start to promote export uh, export-based uh, trade because they realize look we can protect our markets for as long as we want but we're a relatively small island if we're going to do well we have to produce for the world market and they were fortunate in that they had open access to the American consumer market so you get a shift, a really substantial shift, but not until the early 1960s in Taiwan. And what you have in Taiwan in the 50s is, is kind of a mix, but, a, but a, a much heavier component of state-owned industry and something that looks like a softer version of the five-year plan. Uh, so there's a notion of a plan, and they're kind of ambivalent about it in Taiwan. So you've got the, the Stalinization, if you will, 
throughout the 1950s, and then it doesn't really work all of that well. And that, frankly, is why they launched the Great, the great Leap Forward in, 19, uh, in 1958, which turns out to be a bigger disaster, but there actually were economic reasons for it. That the Stalinist central plan only worked so far, and it never worked as well as it did in the Soviet Union in China, because China was far more rural, and crudely, it needed to feed many more people, and it couldn't afford um, the waste of uh, getting rid of all of the rich peasants and slaughtering them, and ha having a five-year uh, meat famine, you know, for example. So uh, different patterns where over time you get the relaxation of state-owned enterprises, but not for a decade. And as a matter, as a product of very particular policies, and you have um, the gradual uh, institute well, shifts and starts of state-owned in industry and state-owned enterprises, uh, and then the whole plan doesn't work that well. So they launch the Great Leap Forward, and that works even less well. But they are so taken with campaign that it takes the party several years to realize that they really have to reverse course on a lot of this. And then they're left with kind of some markets, some rural markets, but a totally state-owned state system uh, in urban areas. And these five-year plans that just don't work very well. And profound stagnation of living standards until the reform era. Thank you. Does how about the chair? Does chair Zaxon want to? Can I pull rank for and ask a quick question? Sure. Um, I, I two two questions. I don't know which one I want to ask. I want to ask a, a lot of questions. But the um, about the, the the use and the deployment of of uh, traditional forums of justice and sort of the, the magistrate, <coughs> the county magistrate, and kind of the cultural vocabulary of what justice looks like. Mm -hmm. Which of these two sides do you think is doing a, a better job of of um, either framing themselves as the inheritors of this kind of justice, or in the case of the communists, is there still a kind of active um, destruction? There's still sort of a May 4th kind of a sense of it's let's destroy those, those traditional appearances of justice. And the Taiwanese, are they trying to do that, or are they trying to be American? Or what, what's, your, what's your sense in terms of their, okay. both their relationship with In the with People's Republic of China, as near as I can tell, <clears throat> they want to destroy it. Um, and in fact, and they want to replace it with something called a socialist legal system or socialist legality. But the problem with any kind of legality and with judges and, and so forth is you've got to have rules that are implemented more or less impersonally. And this is exactly what the campaign to suppress counter-revolutionaries is reacting against because you would you, you, in Sunan, they did a very good job of arresting the big counter-revolutionaries. But the regime was deeply unhappy with the slowness of the pace of judicial procedure. And so the campaign, in a sense, is an override of regular judicial procedure. Uh, so the courts in Sunan are complained about openly <laughs> for dragging their feet, after all this time, they've only executed one counter-revolutionary. This will not do. They need to speed it up. We're going to replace all of this boring, tedious procedure with a campaign. And it's very explicit. You know, it's in public statements, even. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, what, so it's not that they're re so much reacting against old notions of legality. They're even reacting against the new the system that they are putting in place in terms of a reaction against any kind of legality, any kind of procedure, because they want to see the quick results. And they want to use the, the baddies as exemplars for public education uh, and for stirring up the people. Uh, in Taiwan, I, I honestly don't know enough about the legal system the regular civilian legal system in Taiwan, which would be where your magistrates would come in. What they do is that everything comes under martial law, or um, um, a huge amount of activity that 
under normal circumstances would just be criminal is now martialized, so to speak. So under martial law, petty smugglers, for example, uh, people who are crossing borders without the right kinds of permits come under cases of martial law. Regular civilian litigation, I don't know what happens there. But uh, the, there's a very explicit system of military courts that are set up. And they are new. And they are completely run by Guomindang um, hacks, <laughs> yeah. um, who are given rules that they then try as best they can to implement because it's all about le legality and procedure and doing things the right way. Uh, but there's also pressure to conclude cases quickly and to tie cases to each other on the basis of very, very shoddy evidence and, and so forth and so on. So when I first got into the archives in Taiwan to start to look at these cases, I found that, they, that the, main, the main thing that is available, which are these documents called pan chue, or um, legal summaries of legal cases, you know, summary, summary judgment, I guess is what you would call it. They were utterly useless because all they did was they stated, according to the regime, the conclusive guilt uh, thereof. But there's no sense of evidence. There's no sense of questioning. There's no sense of um, alternate views at, at all. These are didactic things. You know, you're guilty, and this is you know how you're guilty. But when you start to actually read these things, there are big holes in them because. None of it is proved. It's just asserted. <laughs> so unfortunately, most of what I collected in Taiwan over a period of a couple of years was really quite useless uh, in terms of figuring out what did and didn't go on. But what was a little bit more useful was a very early collection that had the panjie, that had the legal judgments, but wherever possible, they interviewed people who were associated with the case on the side of the defendants, people who committed lesser crimes and made them put in prison for a while, but then got out. And when this collection was put together in 1998, some of these people were still alive. And it was reading the alternate viewpoints that gave one a sense of how shoddy and slipshod this all really was. And, how, and you can also find, get a sense of this from some of the memoir literature as well. So in neither case is it really about replacing the magistrate. In both cases, it's about establishing your own system and then trying to you know, make it real in the case of Taiwan, or getting frustrated with it because it's doing what systems do, namely move slowly and carefully and procedurally, and overriding the system in the case of, of the People's Republic of China. So it's not really either, but each is different. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Professor Scott. And I didn't even cough that much.